Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Ian Mortimer, author of 1415, Henry V's Year of Glory. Ian comes to Henry V, having already written lives of his predecessors, Edward III and Henry IV. But in 1415, he does something new. He tells the story of the year, day by day, so that the themes, great and small, emerge gradually, and he conveys the rhythms of the medieval year and the preoccupations of the medieval mind. And so, by October 1415, as the battle with the French looms, the reader has a sense of what has led up to it day by day, month by month, and just how much is at stake for Henry. Ian begins his narrative on Christmas Day 1414. I asked him to tell me what was on Henry's mind on the eve of what would turn out to be his year of glory. Well, there's no doubt that he was already planning to go to war in France. That decision in his mind had been made. He had to compromise yet in sending another um, embassy. Uh, he had recently at that point sent another embassy to France, supposedly to negotiate a permanent peace. In reality, to force the French into throwing in the towel and refusing to negotiate further, giving him carte blanche to go to war. But he had another pro- a number of problems. On the Welsh border, he had the, the difficulties arising from Anglindor's re- rebellion. Glyndar was now an old man, he was sick, the, the, the force had gone out of his rebellion, but there was still terrible devastation across Wales and a number of social problems uh, arising from the destruction of the previous 10 years. Um, in Scotland, his father had led, uh, Henry V's father, had led the, the last uh, um, expedition towards trying to, to recapture Scotland for the English throne, had left in ign- ignominy, and um, Henry basically just had a vulnerable border there. It was likely that the Scots were going to make incursions, and he had to rely on family members, notably uh, the Earl of Westmoreland, Ralph Neville, to try and hold the border for him. He had problems internally in the country, and um, Lollardy was really at his height in 1414. Henry himself had seen one of his friends, Sir John Oldcastle, take a, a, a number of people and proclaim a, a heretical rebellion against him. So. Religious questions, political questions, all these are alongside the question of whether he's going to go to war in France, which of course in his mind is the uppermost and most important one, because he could demonstrate through war that he was genuinely the right man to rule England. Because if there's any backdrop to this on Christmas Day 1414, it's the dynastic issue of whether the Lancastrians really are uh, the the favoured family to be ruling the country. This is a big question still in 1414, and it it continues to be so. And in 1415, the year itself, there is a a rebellion to try and get rid of uh, Henry V as king and to impose, dare I say it, the Mortimer family in his place. Edmund and Mortimer would not have made a good king. It is not much to be regretted, but the way Henry V dealt with that situation itself speaks of anger and consternation and worry, which was certainly there at the beginning of the year too. So he had a lot on his plate. I mean, it seemed to me that all of that could sort of be summed up by the word legitimacy. That was the, the sort of the root of the quest was to, to establish the legitimacy of the House of Lancaster. Absolutely. I mean, it had been the, that key word is a great word to pick up on. It really has characterised his entire existence. I mean, he's born in 1386 and his father, the Earl of Derby, is the male heir if Richard II uh, dies without a uh, uh, throne. And the, the order of inheritance laid down by Edward III would have meant that the Richard II's throne should have passed then to John of Gaunt, then to Henry IV, and then Henry V. So he's growing up the first years of his life, being led to believe that he's you know, third in line to the throne. Then his father is pushed away by Rich II, eventually is forced into exile, has all his inheritance confiscated, all his lands confiscated, and Henry V finds himself now the son and heir of a man who's not next in line to the throne, but is an exile and declared a traitor. And this, of course, impacts on his own ideas of legitimacy, because where is God in all this? Though The King of England at this time is a man who is particularly conscious of his relationship with God, not just on a personal basis, but on behalf of his whole kingdom. Now, if Henry was really God's chosen king, and in waiting, as it were, then what what is going to happen? There must have been huge doubt in his mind throughout his youth. Then, of course, his father saw so many rebellions, so many armed uh, attempts on his life, that Henry V must have really despaired whether he was going to live long enough to inherit. And um, what happens if uh, one of these rebellions is successful and not only removes his father, but perhaps kills him too, and his brothers perhaps puts the Mortimers on the throne, perhaps comes up with some spurious Richard II and puts him on the throne. I mean, his entire life as a young man must have been a series of questions of doubt. I think his putting his energies into 
prayer and fighting in Wales was probably the best he could do to sort of find some reassurance and stability with all these doubts. Uh, and this, this big question, is he the legitimate King of England? And then the months that ensue see a twin track approach, you might say. There's a diplomatic mission and discourse with France, but at the same time, there's very serious preparation for war going on in England. Very serious. It's almost, um, well, I will go so far as to say it's almost tedious in its rep repetition. The number of orders there are to prepare this, prepare that, you get a very clear sense of how complicated it is to prepare an overseas expedition. If you're going to take um, 13, 15,000 men abroad, most of them with horses, probably more than 15,000 horses with you. You have to get the ships, you have to get the mariners, you have to get all these people to the right place. You have to equip them, you have to find food, you have to keep the law and order while they're all gathering. And if you're going to take 9,000 archers and you're going to equip them with um, 100 arrows each, then you're going to have to have an awful lot of arrows made. You're going to have to transport those arrows, likewise the bows. The amount of organisation in staging an overseas expedition is utterly extraordinary. And I think historians have tended to take them for granted because there were so many expeditions in the Hundred Years' War. And of course Edward III had set a pattern which was continued for, for many years. He was a past master at it. So when Henry V comes along and you look at it um, in great detail and you see the, his determination to succeed, coupled with the level of uh, preparation necessary, you start to engage with the preparations in a totally different way. You, you, you understand why there are so many orders, why there are commissions to people to go and confiscate woodworkers or stonemasons or, or simply wagons. 